Hi, everybody. My name is Wilbur. I'm the coordinator of Twin Cities Group 37, and this is the second half of our February 20th uh, general meeting. We're pleased to have with us Todd Pierce as our speaker today. Todd's going to be speaking about Guantanamo. Let me give just a let me give the Todd's bio, which is incredibly impressive. Military historian and former JAG pro bono military commission defense counsel at Guantanamo. Todd has represented three defendants before the military commissions at Guantanamo. He has presented on Guantanamo many times before different organizations, including at our own May 2016 meeting, gave an excellent presentation on the dysfunction at Guantanamo. This presentation will mark the 20th anniversary of the opening of the detention center at Guantanamo Bay, where there are still 39 prisoners and almost 20 of them whom have been cleared for release but remain in custody at a cost of 14, over $14 million per prisoner per year. So with that, I'm gonna turn over the meeting to Todd and welcome him to our meeting today. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm hearing some background noise. There it's gone. Uh, anyway, first let me apologize to everybody for not being at the last meeting, meeting when I had said I would be. It just uh, slipped my calendar, and I apologize very much for that. Uh, you mentioned uh, Julian Assange. There's a, I was supposed to have been at an event at 3 o'clock, which I forego because this is takes priority. But a new book just came out. Maybe you guys are all aware of it. Uh, by Niels Melzer, The Trial of Julian Assange. Uh, Melzer is a UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. Uh, just came out within the last few weeks, I believe. Another recent book, let me hold up too, is uh, Don't Forget Us Here, uh, Lost and Found at Guantanamo by Mansour Adafi. And I recommend both of them. Uh, neither one of them have I finished reading, but uh, have been going through them. Anyway, highly recommend each. Uh, the second book, the Don't Forget Us Here, is a good refresher for some of what I want to speak about. And the Assange book is incredibly important because if it wasn't for Assange, we wouldn't know a lot of what we know about Guantanamo. Uh, I mean, as a Guantanamo de defense attorney, I saw that little sliver of what we were allowed to see, but there's a whole lot that we weren't allowed to see. And that's still going on being uncovered more and more. Uh, but before we get going too much, let me just read a couple things here. Uh, this is from a filing by the United States government. Uh, would have been back in around, uh, 2014, 2015, and um, I'm just picking one, one case, one citation out of a number of them. Uh, so uh, alleged abuse of treatment and torture in Iraq and Afghanistan between 2003 and 2004, authorized or condoned by individual defendants. And these individual defendants are the uh, military commanders, the CIA uh, people involved with torture, et cetera. And, uh, and then it picks up included beating, stabbing, mutilation, hooding, confinement, and phone booth sized wooden box, prolonged de sleep deprivation enforced by beatings, inadequate food and water, mock execution and death threats, sexual assault, exposure to dangerously high temperatures for prolonged periods, inadequate medical care, painful restraints and positions, and intimidation with vicious dogs. This is just one case. Uh, I'm reading cited in a filing by the United States government in response to a lawsuit that I helped on uh, by Mohammed Jawad in seeking damages before the um, federal court in DC uh, for the torture that he had been subjected to. He had been captured as a, I believe he was uh, about 14 years old, maybe even younger in Afghanistan and then subjected to all these various horrendous tortures, including some of what I just listed. But the point in all of that, in the case I was on, it was too dismissed, even though we listed a whole series and lists of uh, torture techniques that had been applied to him, uh, including sleep deprivation, which uh, uh, you know Solzhenitsyn and Begin both called the very worst of the very worst tortures that they had been subjected to. Uh, and. Uh, and in every case, these, these cases were all dismissed 
because the people, the defendants, US government officials were acting within the scope of their employment. Now just think about that for a second. That should just absolutely offend every US citizen here that the United States adopted basically their own version of, I was just following orders. This is almost worse in a way. Uh, scope of their employment. If you go to work for the federal government, for the CIA, the military, commit war crimes, torture, et cetera, et cetera, you have immunity uh, from prosecution or, or even civil suits for what you, the damage you did because you're acting within the scope of your employment. Now, if you're a low level person at Abu Ghraib, for example, uh, and, and your, your superiors uh, deny that they had instructed you to do the various things that they had, uh, you don't necessarily have that defense. But then, of course, they're low level and who cares about them anyway? But if you're a high level government official or even a medium level uh, government official, you have a get out of jail card, uh, you know, immunity from civil suits, et cetera, because you're acting within the scope of US government employment to torture and do all these things. So I, I want to bring that up at the very beginning. Uh, this is a context we're talking about. Everything that follows is uh, my own uh, indictment, you could call it, of US government officials for their war crimes, even though a US court will never allow it to be heard within the courts, uh, or at least will immediately dismiss it before it even gets before the court with just mere paper dismissal. But just very quickly, uh, how I got involved in this uh, has something to do with J Mohammed Jawad. I uh, volunteered and had been waiting for the opportunity from the almost from 9-11, because I knew what I saw immediately what was going on in the military commissions it was going to be a, a war crime. It's the military commissions themselves are war crimes. Uh, and let me just, uh, well, while we're, uh, I lost, I guess here, but uh, a, I'm on an email list. So, so anyway, I, I reported to the military commissions defense office in June of 2008. Uh, I arrived there and the office was pretty empty because uh, most people were at the time were down in Guantanamo, which would go, people would go down there for a week at a time, meet with their clients, then come back and would continue working generally in D the DC area where the main offices were at. So when I arrived there, uh, the office was fairly empty, but uh, the, the one, one attorney in the office was going out to interview a former commander at Guantanamo in regard to Muhammad Jawad. And so I went out there with him and I, I heard him uh, take the de deposition of this um, general. Um, and um, anyway, that's where I first heard about the uh, sleep deprivation program that was called the Frequent Flyer Program, which Jawad, who was a child, you know, he's, he's a child, uh, 14, 15 at the time, but that's a child under international law as it is under any law. Uh, was subjected to sleep deprivation, the worst of the worst tortures. What they would do is, uh, and by that time, this was 2008, but uh, a couple of years earlier it had come the military commissions at various things to present the appearance that we are abiding by international law, convention against torture, uh, the military commissions act, but it was all intended only to provide a patina of legitimacy to the war crimes that we were committing at Guantanamo on a routine daily basis. And so what they would do, because uh, you know complaints had been heard at some level or other, and they said, okay, you've got to allow these, you know, the, these prisoners to have at least four hours, I believe it was, uh, you know, where they can supposedly sleep. So to the inventive mind of the military and the CIA, they quickly adapted to that by they would allow a block of time, calling it four hours, for the prisoner to be in their cell, but they would constantly move them. So every uh, half hour or so. 15 minutes, they'd come by, open up the cell, take them out, move them to another cell. So you can imagine how much sleep you get in four hours if you never stop being on the move. And that's what Jawad was subjected to. Uh, the happy ending to Jawad only came years later. Uh, that was in 2008 that I first heard about this. Jawad was released, um, I think in around 2000, don't hold me to this, 2011 maybe. He, he got two very good attorneys who uh, went over to Afghanistan and investigated the crime scene itself. And it turned out it was impossible for this to have, that for J J Jawad to have done what he is accused of doing, which was to throw a grenade, I believe, into a passing truck of US military members uh, because he wasn't even in the area. And I forget a couple other details that made it 
totally impossible that he could have done this. But yet the CIA, the military, all kept him for years, tortured him for years uh, in, in claiming that he was a terrorist. You know, uh, and the other part of the war crime is uh, that they invented, this was totally a fabrication by the US government, the concept or the category of unlawful combatants. This book explains it pretty well by Sybil Shipers, A Genealogy of the Irregular Fighter. That being an irregular fighter is not a war crime. Uh, we, we celebrate irregular fighters, so, you know, the unlawful combatants. We, if you go to France, they're buried in the Parthenon, you know, heroes of the resistance from World War II that fought the Germans, for example. Uh, my dad was in the Bataan Death March, speaking of the Philippines, and uh, he got rescued in 1945 in what becomes sort of a famous raid. And he was entirely, you know, that raid was successful because the Filipinos, irregular fighters, you know, helped the US Army rescue these American POWs. So, but when 9-11 when happened uh, and, and Israel had already been doing this for years before, uh, we're deeming anybody who gives, provides any resistance whatsoever, even just verbal, uh, to the occupying authority, or in the case of the United States, where we consider ourselves to be the global hegemon, we deem them to be war criminals. We turn it completely upside down. The, the, the people that we have who are torturing the most uh, worst, odious forms of torture that the world has ever seen, we deem them as acting within the scope of their employment. But should you write something, perhaps, or like in Israel, a Palestinian, write something, maybe graffiti on a wall, or in the United States, or rather under the US global jurisdiction that we uh, as assert uh, something critical of the United States, you know, you might be picked up and tossed into Guantanamo. And, um, and of course we have, we had many journalists in Guantanamo being held there for years, which, uh, you know, just a matter of deduction can be assumed to have been because they're writing critical of the United States, whether critical of drone killings, by the United States, like in Pakistan, uh, at least one journalist uh, I, I know of, uh, you know, all the evidence would show that he had been killed just for writing critically of the United States. Uh, you know, he, that, that journalist was killed, but Guantanamo held a number of other journalists. All this goes together into a mosaic that you really have to understand. It's not, you can't pull one element out of it and make sense of it. Guantanamo by itself cannot be abstracted from the U.S. global war on terror, meaning drone killings around the world, or U.S. assertions of global hegemony, because everything follows from that, that any resistance uh, is deemed to be illegal, you know, criminality, uh, you know, war crime by the United States. So all of this has to be kept in context that this is really a totalitarian global measure being used against the world. Uh, and we and we house, the, house these people in Guantanamo. Now, the fact that we have largely gotten most uh, prisoners out of there. You know, we're down to 39, I believe it is now. Uh, you know, having started at, I think, over 800, when Rumsfeld and Bush were saying they were the worst of the worst, and turned out most for various things like, you know, agricultural related, I'll say, goat herders in Afghanistan or whatever, who were turned over to the U.S. Army for bounties. And we were all too happy to throw them into Kandahar and then Guantanamo, you know, with a joyous abandon where we would torture them, not, not just the CIA, not just the psychologists like Jessen and Mitchell, but ordinary American soldiers who had been fed lies that these are the people responsible for 9-11. Uh, a, a former Guantanamo guard, Terry Holbrooks is a friend of mine and I've interviewed him and uh, he talks of how when they were being deployed as a army reserve unit, go as guards to Guantanamo, uh, they were first taken to the, the World Trade Center site, and we're showing showing that you know destruction, and said the people you're going to be guarding are the ones responsible for this, and so he said you know his unit, uh, and even himself perhaps uh, probably not himself he's a little more better thinking than the rest of his unit, but they, they were all fired up to go deal with these people who had attacked us at on 9/11, and they weren't at all involved with 9/11 or with even attacking the United States in any way, but they were busy herding their sheep or whatever they're doing on the day of 9-11. But yet they turned up in Guantanamo and were tortured for years uh, until finally the, the um, uh, you know, it was becoming so evident what we were doing that they had to begin 
releasing them slowly, but even that only picked up under Obama. Unfortunately, Obama continued the drone strikes or even accelerated them. So it's like whatever administration we get, the problem is changed in a different way, if not exacerbated. But uh, so that, that was my introduction to Jawad, that first or second day I was there. And then I helped on that case and became aware of the, you know, acting in the scope of my employment defense to war crimes. Uh, uh, but so bad is this that, um, and I, I was just looking it up, uh, the War Crimes Act, the United States had a War Crimes Act, which was passed back, I believe it was the 1990s, which made it a war crime or, or made it uh, prosecutable for any U.S. official to be charged with war crimes if they committed war crimes under the War Crimes Act. But when 9-11 happened, that, uh, that War Crimes Act was eviscerated within a year or two or a couple of years uh, after so that no officials could be charged with war crimes. Uh, that, that in itself is a war crime uh, without being, you know, without quoting the law, but uh, international law, but you, but, but we can quote precedents from the Tokyo uh, War Crimes Tribunal following World War II, Nuremberg. Uh, if a country gives impunity to a war criminal, that is itself a war crime. I represented three prisoners. Uh, one, I was um, a resource, uh, what's called, we call resource attorney. So I, that was mainly historical research and uh, making a uh, argument, you know, a mitigation argument for why he, this person, when the inevitable conviction came, uh, has, still has been charged or, or, or uh, tried, but it's in the process on the 9-11, five 9-11 detainees, prisoners. Uh, so I worked on that. So I did a lot of historical research on war crimes, uh, Nuremberg, Tokyo, everything related to this. And the other case I was on, two other cases, was uh, Ibrahim al Kosi, which is a relatively simple case. But I made the argument there to the judge. Uh, and, and for background, we had been trying to talk to the prosecutors on that case to get some kind of resolution to it because he was a you know, low level person who uh, had had a connection to Al Qaeda in Al Afghanistan. But he was in no way, no sense, a high level person or anybody would have been involved with planning 9-11, et cetera, uh, had been involved with the, you know, the, the fighting, you know, that uh, took place in Afghanistan after the, you know, after the Soviets were, you know, defeated uh, as just one of many factions. So hardly a war criminal. But uh, I made the argument to the, so on the way down that day, that, that time, we were talking to the prosecution, they were just you know, turning their noses up at us. We're not going to talk. You don't know how horrible guy this is, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and then we I made a motion. Our team did, and I argued it, uh, wrote it. So I did a lot of research, uh, what was called an article for an Article 5 hearing. Under Geneva Conventions, the four, uh, third Geneva Convention, Article 5 provides that if there's any doubt, if some a prisoner asserts that they're not a legitimately a prisoner of war, but they fall into some other category, uh, they're entitled to an Article 5 hearing. And there, the government, the, 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 the military holding them has to provide at least some evidence that they are legitimately holding this person. And so I argued in this Article 5 hearing that uh, not only, you know, under Geneva are they entitled to a hearing, but furthermore, if the judge did not order the hearing under the precedent that the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal, largely run by the United States, then that judge herself was a war criminal and should be tried for a war crime. Uh, I don't know how persuasive that was, but the next day, and I'm going to make a wild guess that she consulted with higher ranking officers, including probably the CIA, whom it's no secret, are always in constant, uh, you know, watchfulness over the proceedings at Guantanamo and, uh, you know, have a 40 second delay that they can cut off any, any speakers before somebody says something that they don't want heard. Uh, so the next day she ordered an Article 5 hearing. And uh, you know, miraculously, I'm saying that facetiously, uh, the prosecution on the way back up to D.C. had entirely changed. All of a sudden, they were willing to talk to us, you know, and we ended up getting a, a good deal for that person, and he only had to serve two more years. There's more to it. Some of the complexities or the the you know lies of Guantanamo behind it. You know, it was it was ordered secret, and I'm not revealing it. You know, it was under seal. 
but a journalist had somebody leak it to her that he only had to serve two more years and that's how it came out. And two years later, he was released, not before a lot of drama, you know, of whether or not the government would release him, but, uh, but he was. Uh, but the other case I was on is an appellate case and that one's still going on. It's been going on since 2009 when I was asked to join that team. So I had to do a lot of research on that into these issues of war crimes. And, uh, and again, uh, you know, the, the government routinely lies. Uh, we would get filings from the government. I'm going to just cite one case instance here. And, you, you, you know, the government is always relying upon William Winthrop, this Civil War era, uh, you know, JAG officer. But they, they lie by omission. Uh, I won't go into, you know, details, the murkiness of it. But uh, it says one thing, but the government always cuts off the critical part so that it sounds like something else. And it goes to the issue of conspiracy. So Balul, we, we won on a couple counts. Uh, he was charged with material support for terrorism, solicitation, and conspiracy. We actually won before the DC Circuit Court of Appeals and had the charges dismissed of uh, material support for terrorism and uh, solicitation. But the charge of conspiracy was upheld, even though that's a one charge, but that has never been considered a war crime. Uh, meaning, meaning in co uh, conspiracy, a conspiracy that you don't actually do anything. The only conspiracy offense that's ever been upheld as war crime was the war crime of aggressive, you know, conspiracy to wage aggressive war or genocide, not conspiracy just to do what. So it's just that the entire system, the entire edifice, and I can't call it a legal regime because it's not a legal regime. It's a system, and uh, the email I was mentioning. Uh, was from an attorney that's on a uh, email list I'm on, uh, pointing out to to people, and uh, I've been saying this for years, is that these are not legal proceedings. They're no sense legal proceedings. The U.S. government has made up the rules as they go along. Uh, ever from the beginning of the military commission order number one, that was first written up by somebody connected to Cheney. I forget which one in particular. A couple of people were involved. Uh, totally illegal. And when, when uh, Hamdan, the Hamdan case uh, uh, ordered, uh, you know, or, or held that conspiracy is not a war crime, and Ham, you know, they went back and rewrote it, and mostly got the Republicans, but there's always a considerable number of Democrats who will go along with the Republicans on this stuff. So they passed Military Commissions Act 2006, and then when that didn't hold up, 2009. I may be getting a couple of my facts wrong here because I didn't lay it out on a whiteboard or anything. But uh, trust me, it's, it's generally accurate here. And so they redid it so that it would withstand supposedly scrutiny by the courts, but only if the courts really avert their eyes from the actual facts and the historical record of what constitutes a war crime. So uh, just stepping back for one second here, a couple more points. Uh, I got involved, when I got involved and volunteered, and uh, this was beginning again in 2008, uh, I was in, put in touch with David Weisbrot, who at University of Minnesota Human Rights Center. And I collaborated with him, you know, or he mentored me, however you want to put it, for years. And unfortunately, he's passed away now. But he introduced me to the Fair Trial Rights uh, Amnesty International Manual, which I believe he authored quite a bit of, if not all of it. Uh, but the whole point being is that this, this entire system is based upon the denial of fair trial rights whether under the law of armed conflict, meaning Geneva, or under US federal law. And so that's what makes it a, a war crime in itself. Again, just like the Tokyo war crime uh, tribunals held that those people who denied fair trial rights to the, it was the Doolittle Raiders who were the subject of the denial, uh, that by denying them fair trial rights, the people in charge, the JAG officers, the judges, whatever, they were all committing war crimes. And that's what we have at Guantanamo. And uh, we, we only have, uh, we've never reformed it. We've only sort of put a little bit of perfume on it to make it uh, appear legitimate. Uh, let me add another thing, and this has come up a number of times, and uh, it's, it's almost like I'm getting tired of uh, trying to point this out to people. But first of all, you need to understand that the military, by its very nature, lies. It's part of the job. Uh, every military order now to a, at a command higher than, I believe, battalion uh, requires a uh, information uh, operation uh, annex, which is telling you how, telling the you know, command 
telling you know everyone involved how we're going to lie about this. If something happens, like uh, the the uh, soldier who got killed, the the former football player, this is how we're going to lie about it. You know, it's it's a continuous information operation, influence operation. Uh, I've been looking at this, and I have a background in uh, uh, psychological operations going back to the 1980s with the military. So I, I didn't come to this sort of figuring it out, but I already knew a lot of this. But uh, it's gotten so much more sophisticated. Uh, so again, more research I've done, you know, takes you know back to the Vietnam War. So much of what really developed, you know, what we're doing today came out of the Vietnam War. When the Vietnam War, a unwinnable war from the very beginning, was lost, the generals who had been in charge of a failed policy and strategy uh, all came up with uh, scapegoats to say, you know, we didn't lose it, but it was, you know, we were stabbed in the back. They they had they couldn't use that phrase because the Germans had already used it back after World War One, and of course that was a favorite theme of the Nazis. We were stabbed in the back in World War One, and so what's uh, what's the answer if you were stabbed in the back? Well, you need to control. The flow of information, no more allowing an anti-war movement to grow and, and turn the people against the war, but rather you have to, you know, the United States calls it perception management for years, the DOD calls it perception management, and uh, taking their lead perhaps from uh, the Israelis who are far advanced in this, uh, now call it uh, the cognitive campaign. Just do a search on cognitive campaign. There's a lengthy document that I just found a month or two ago uh, by the Israeli uh, National Security Strategy Foundation or something, something like that, uh, going very much in depth. And uh, this, this all rang a bell because I studied pretty much, uh, I went to New York to the New School to study uh, a master's in politics, but in it, I began studying Hannah Arendt more. And then by her, we have her, Edmund Husserl, who talks about the science of consciousness. And this is what we're talking about. This is such a higher level than what we used to think of as propaganda that, uh, you really have to understand how our very minds are, yes, this is not meant to sound weird, this is meant to sound like cognitive science. You know, cognitive science knows how if you don't have access to certain information, it's not gonna enter your consciousness, so you don't even know about it. So the whole point comes into controlling the information, perception management. This is what Ed, uh, you know, Julian Assange's so-called crime is. He gave us information and was having an effect. It was turning people against our war crime wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and, and, uh, and against Israel's occupation and many other things. And so he had to be taken down. Uh, he, his crime is not any of the things that they list, but his crime is giving us information. The, you know, a demo democratic, so-called democratic people's uh, population information about what our officials were doing, the war crimes they were committing. That's why Julian Assange is being tried under the Espionage Act. It not, has nothing to do with espionage. The Espionage Act, you know, if you look and research it, uh, was really begun as a sedition act, anti-sedition act in the very earliest stage. And uh, uh, Alfred McCoy has written about this coming out of the Philippine-American War, which I had to do extensive research on for one of the cases. Uh, you know, we, we had adopted these totalitarian measures ahead of the so-called totalitarian states that would come afterward. So we were charging and torturing the Filipinos in the first, the Spanish-American War, then the uh, U.S.-Filipino War, and then the suppression, the war of pacification against the Filipinos, which followed for quite a while. Uh, some of you people know that better than I do. But all these things were totalitarian measures that you would expect to see in any totalitarian state. They were brought into the United States system under the Espionage Act, which they labeled espionage first because the Sedition Act had such a stink to it from earlier efforts for, of uh, suppressing what they called sedition, uh, that they called it the Espionage Act. But the whole point was to suppress any dissent to entry into World War I. And, uh, and, and, and as you, some of you all know, any dissent to the war itself uh, or, or you know, to the government by you know, socialists of the time like Eugene Debs. And, uh, and that's been used, that's what was used against, uh, you know, is being used against whistleblowers today because they're giving information out to the citizens of the world and the United States that is telling them that your government, in case the United States, is committing war crimes of the most horrible sort and you should do something about it and they don't want anything to be done about it. Meaning our officials, the same people who did all these horrible tortures that I listed at the beginning of this session. So, um, 
and I'll, I'll open this up to questions. I hope I haven't been rattling on too long in a, in a drone, but uh, but that's what this this has to all be seen as part of. Uh, and um, so getting back to uh, uh, Guantanamo, uh, you know, it has to all be seen in the context of a totalitarian system, you know, which which uh, has been called inverted totalitarianism by a Princeton University political theorist back in 2003. But all of this is how we are denied, supposed to be denied information by way of cognitive campaigns uh, is the current terminology being used. Let me stop there and ask for questions. And again, I hope I haven't got too much in the you know, so-called weeds and, and lost too many people here. But bring me back on track, please. Uh, simple question. Were you in the military when you handled those three cases? Yeah. So uh, my, I, I was uh, on and off, my military career is non-traditional. I was on and off active duty uh, over years where I've accumulated enough years to retire. Uh, I, I've admitted I was a neoconservative in the 1980s when I'd gone into this active duty program. Uh, after going to the first Gulf War, uh, you call it, I renounced so-called neoconservatism against this militarism, uh, but I stayed in and out of the reserve and uh, on active duty as a JAG officer then for a few years. And uh, then came the Iraq war, uh, we would have been re relocated. So I got off active duty again, but I stayed in the reserves because I intended to volunteer as a Guantanamo defense attorney, knowing by then that there would be military commissions. So, uh, so when uh, uh, 2008 was coming along, I went back on active duty, was pulled back on active duty then, and was until the end of 2012. Since then, I've rena remained on the Baloo case, the appellate case, but now as a retiree. Uh, actually still listed uh, by the uh, Human Rights Center at the U of M's law school, thanks to Peter Weiss, Weiss wrote, uh, David Weiss wrote, there's Peter Weiss, another friend, but David Weiss wrote, made me a senior fellow of the Human Rights Center. And they've, uh, you know, uh, consent to let me continue as that for the purpose of this case, the Balul case. So yeah, so uh, now I'm a civilian though. And did you just start, you mentioned the first Gulf War? Do you have a, uh, a criticism of that one? Yes, I do, uh, and that's where I really had my eyes opened to uh, government lies. Uh, you know, where I was stationed, and I was a computer technician at Ben, uh, and, uh, but I'd gotten, gotten interested in, uh, again, having been a neoconservative, I'd gotten interest in low intensity conflict as something of a, a student of it. And so, uh, so I knew that and, uh, you know, information warfare and whatnot. And I went over to the first Gulf War and where I was at was at an air base uh, to begin with at least, and there the suite there of Hill and Knowlton public relations firm, which was uh, the real center of our information war. They're the ones who fabricated the stories of, of babies being pulled out by Iraqi troops uh, of Kuwaiti uh, incubators, for example, and a number of other lurid stories told by what we now know was a daughter of a Kuwaiti official. Now, I'm not denying, I'm, I'm not an apologist for some of these regimes here, you know, they, they're violate human rights. So I'm not apologizing for Iraq in that case, for example, except to say they didn't do that. That that turned out to be a fabrication. So it's never enough because it doesn't rise, it doesn't create the uh, passions that you need to get people to go to war. So it's never enough to say, well, you know, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Let's not get into the details of how they might have been, how Kuwait might have been stealing oil from Iraq, et cetera. But uh, instead, they have to make it up to that, take it up to the highest level to excite the passions, as, as uh, Clausewitz would have said, to prepare us for war. Uh, Rand Corporation has been involved with this going back to the 1990s. All the stories of uh, Russia waging information war against the United States over these last uh, 20 years. You know, uh, again, Hannah Arendt would always say, you have to get back to the origins of something. And the origins were, we were waging information war against Russia from the very beginning of the end of the Cold War. Rand Corporation was holding conferences and uh, one, one, uh, one, one paper I just came across again was uh, always preparing, conditioning the battlefield for the potential that any country, we might eventually go to war against them. So we've been waging global information war against the world 
ever since the end of the Cold War. But we always attribute it when a time comes to this next enemy we intend to attack. Today, Russia uh, and China, and uh, we brought ourselves right to the abyss because we, we've, again, we've excited the passions of the American people. We're not gonna take it anymore. These Russians and Chinese and Iranians have to stop this, you know, what they're doing to us, et cetera. It's, it's the way it's, it works. And here we are on the verge. I'm on the uh, uh, Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy now, thanks to a friend, Peter Weiss, uh, now. And so I'm closely following the risks of nuclear war. And uh, let me throw in one more thing. When I was in the Gulf War, I was told when I asked a senior officer, what would happen if the war went against us? And I was told sort of secretively that, well, if that happens, we've got tactical nuclear weapons there ready for use. Believe me, uh, a war could quickly escalate into a nuclear exchange just from the beginning of a low level conventional war, just because of US strategy. Um, so I don't know, did I answer that question? <laughs> I, I hop around a bit, I apologize. I, I, I've, I've got a question uh, about what, if, if you know, if you go into uh, do some lobbying uh, with like we did with Emmer's uh, staffer, one of the questions will 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 be, uh, what do you do now? I mean, the military commissions are obviously a, a failure. There are, like you said, I think you said five 9-11 defendants that were really involved with 9-11. There are a few of them. Uh, and, you know, the, the answer, of course, is to put them into the U.S. judicial system. But then what do you do when these guys have been tortured and the uh, all the evidence is inadmissible? And so you got yourself in a little bit of a conundrum there. So what, what, do, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, <clears throat> let's hypothetically, let's say that the, well, I think there's arguments to be made that not all five of the 90 so-called 9-11 prisoners uh, merit execution or even life sentences. Uh, <clears throat> I worked on the Hassawi team for a year, like I say, as a uh, <coughs> uh, resource attorney, did a lot of research, and uh, he, he was one of the worst torturees that there were. All he handled though, his, his crime was he handled some money supposedly. Not whether he even knew what was gonna be used, how that money is gonna be used. Now, now recognize, let's be honest here too, uh, which I don't have to tell you guys, but uh, United States has been, and, and, and Israel uh, have been waging war in the Middle East uh, going back uh, at least to well, the United, Israel, as you know, much longer, but the United States for sure since 1982, when we actively went in, um, you know, in, in Lebanon. Yeah. And, uh, and we sort of presided over a lot of what was going on. That's where Osama bin Laden says he got, as he is watching uh, the Navy shell Beirut, U.S. Navy, uh, he, he determined that somebody's got to resist the United States. Anyway, the point is, is uh, war is reciprocal. So if you commit, you, you commit an act of war against somebody, you have to expect that they're going to commit an act of war back. Uh, so whether or not that had taken final form and shape in Bin Laden's mind, uh, certainly with the uh, Gulf War. Okay, let me one. So I went to the Gulf War. We were our unit, the unit I'd just been assigned to pretty much, uh, been there only a month. When when uh, August 2nd happened, we were told we'd go on alert right away because that had been their pre-existing mission. So, and we got there as one of the first units to be sent over to Saudi Arabia. And when we did, and even before we left, I, I was told that the computer I worked on, which maintained all the ammo stockages, was not gonna come back. It was gonna be left in Saudi Arabia. Well then, skip forward to the end of the war, and our mission then became setting up all these logistic spaces because the United States was not going to leave Saudi Arabia. We, we got our toe in there and we were not going to leave it. So we were working with the Saudi regime, uh, setting up all these US military bases, you know, to, to occupy the Middle East. We don't need to occupy it with military forces every step, every foot. Uh, there's a good book out about the pointillist empire by a Northwestern University professor, came out a couple of years ago, pointing out that our empire is a pointillist empire around the globe with lily pads, military bases. Well, that's what we were doing in Saudi Arabia. 
uh, we only moved out of there when we got uh, later got Co I'm sorry, uh, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. So we only moved out of Saudi Arabia when we moved everything forward to Kuwait. Much later, though, we stayed in Saudi Arabia. And of course, we propped up the Saudi regime with everything that they were doing. Uh, so it's not to oversimplify anything, but but that was uh, one of the main motivations, as Bin Laden said, because the United States was, in essence, occupying Saudi Arabia and pulling the strings uh, of their proxies. So that's what led to 9-11. And so you can make an argument going by the precedent set by irregular forces in, 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 in France and uh, against the Japanese, that by resisting a foreign occupier or invader, that's legitimate. And I'm not saying you know, 9-11 was legitimate, but I'm saying that people that were peripherally involved weren't necessarily guilty of the most horrendous of war crimes, even though we've turned it into that. So the point, long answer to say, yeah, you'd have to look at each individual case more, but we just group them all as the five 9-11 people or a couple of others and say, we got to do this because we got to execute them. Well, we don't necessarily have to execute them. And after 20 years in imprisonment, Maybe they're even they, some of them should be released. Uh, You're going to have to make a tough argument because politically that's oh, going to I've be got hard. no illusions. I've got no illusions. Yeah, I'm, that's what a political hard, hard sell. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, the military commissions have been a complete failure. Uh, I normally you would go to trial and weigh all the evidence, but what can you do when you? Yeah, in, in, in this case, I mean, it may, you know, the guy handled a little bit of money and he spent 20 years in jail already. Oh, maybe you should go home. I mean, that's, yeah. Well, that's, and that's, but, uh, but I would disagree with you when you say they've been a complete failure. I mean, it depends upon what you think the mission was. If it was to bring justice to these people, then it's been a complete failure. And, and by that, I mean, both the, the victims of 9-11, and uh, in, in the people that we've been held. But if it was to set up an ulterior alternative system, now they're, they're expanding Guantanamo now, they're not shrinking it. They're adding another courthouse, ostensibly for the five people, but they've got at plenty of room for that. Uh, they've also got, and again, not to sound, you, you don't have to sound like a conspiracy theorist to say, and I, and I read closely the Senate argument going on about this by John McCain, Lindsey Graham and Joe Lieberman, in 2011 and passing the 2012 National Defense Authorization Act, where they included Section 1021, which provided that the US government, US military could put people into prison, military, military detention, strictly for what they might say. And, and that was fleshed out more under the Hedges v. Obama lawsuit, where a US Department of Justice attorney admitted that Chris Hedges or, or, or Daniel Ellsberg uh, or Noam Chomsky could be put into military detention just for what they write. And that's on the books, you know? So uh, I sort of expected Trump to have uh, utilized that. And I think if he'd have gotten a second term, he might have. Uh, he's not out of the picture yet. Uh, I think because of his constituency, Biden would have to be more careful of that. But we're, we're on the verge of a major war. It's hard to say how that could be used today. But, you know, one of the things on Guantanamo, the uh, the State Department Foreign Operations uh, Appropriations has had within it uh, prohibitions against transfer of those prisoners to the U.S. soil, uh, and also money to be spent at Guantanamo. Uh, McCollum has been able to get that stripped out of the House version, so it isn't. So that stuff is going to be taken out of the House version, it, but you know it still it still has to go just to uh, uh, you know compromise with what the Senate says. But if that were to go forward, you know you have to you have to uh, do do something uh, other than what they're what they're doing now. And uh, yeah, I mean it's a hard question for us to answer because we don't have any uh, expertise in. Uh, you know, thinking about this other than, uh, uh, you know, what we read in the news and it, it would seem, you know, we got supermax prisons, we've got all kinds of stuff, but we don't have uh, a mechanism for trying people that have been tortured. 
No, exactly. And uh, let me be clear, I'm not acting as an apologist for everybody being held at Guantanamo. Uh, again, after a fair trial, some should be held the rest of their lives, you know, uh, perhaps. Uh, but, uh, but again, it's just this whole system uh, has been, and, and again, when you look at what I'll call the Cheney administration, how they set it all up, the whole system was designed as an authoritarian system. It's, you know, it's a bigger story than just to say that, but, uh, but now we're, now we have it. And uh, anyway. Todd, I think you make a convincing case on the U.S. war crimes that do meet the international evidentiary standards. We've been unsuccessful in taking jurisdiction away from the military and from the intelligence community. It's, uh, it looks as though our legislature is unwilling or unable. Our judiciary is unwilling or unable. They'll always pay deference to the statements of the military and the intelligence. It looks as though the International Criminal Court would be a difficult path to proceed. Uh, we can talk about universal jurisdiction as a means of holding the U.S. accountable, but really, given that the United States is a rogue state and a superpower, how can we begin to hold the, the, the U.S. accountable for these war crimes? I, I wish you could tell me. Uh, <laughs> as you know, we, we don't allow jurisdiction by the International Criminal Court against right. United States citizens. Israel doesn't either. We, uh, uh, Trump, even as you may recall, even, uh, how, how did he do it? But basically criminalized the officers of the ICC. Uh, I, I read Haaretz uh, and, and I re read them every day, read that newspaper, right. Israeli really newspaper, because they were the only one that gave a accurate portrayal of the Trump Netanyahu uh, alliance. And uh, I mean, it was so bad that Miriam Adelson called for a book of the Bible to be named after Donald Trump. Uh, I, I make a point uh, that, and I've got a book handy here, but I'm not going to dig for it, uh, on the Israeli radical right. Uh, I don't look at, I'm not referring to that as a Jewish radical right, I'm looking at it as a radical right movement, which ha has a very close alliance with U.S. radical right rightists, which I would include the entire Republican Party on that, and unfortunately too much of the Democratic Party, with uh, only... You know, so we, we go from Trump and Netanyahu to Biden and Bennett. But right now we have uh, being held up. Uh, when did it begin? The six, the hit six uh, NGOs, Israeli NGOs that have been, what, criminalized basically by Israel. Uh, Israel was adamant about getting, uh, defying the ICC and Trump gave them the means to do that uh, or, or join with them in doing that. So it's, it's uh, like I say, it's a, Part of a all of this fits into a bigger mosaic that is almost uh, mon too too big a uh, you know thing to address. It's like it's beyond our control. But I don't mean to sound like a defeatist. I believe uh, it's critical that people you know constantly uh, try to learn more and oppose it and, and inform others, et cetera, et cetera, and uphold those uh, liberal values that were supposedly founded upon. But, uh, but as far as uh, offering an answer, I'm afraid I don't have one, except- Thanks. Um, I have a question and that is, I wanna get back to the um, um, Guantanamo detainees that have been cleared for release and that there's uh, a lot of resistance to releasing them. Uh, do you have any ideas about how we can um, improve on that or, or, or improve on that process or get that process started or try and provide some sort of uh, uh, approach to maybe trying to put pressure on getting that happening and maybe comment about your experience about uh, why there so much resistance in releasing people. Uh, well, fortunately, and I'm, I'm not wild about the Biden administration, especially since we're on the verge of war, but as I tell people who, uh, uh, you know, who, you know, that Donald Trump is the one who put those forces up on the Russian border, you know, uh, this is this is a myth that both uh, the, the right, you know, the so-called non-interventionist right, uh, you know, that some of those like 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 Ron Paul, uh, you know, wanted had to be appealed to, you know, to 
by a candidate say, I'm gonna end the war. So Trump came up with a message that I'm gonna end the wars. But he also came up with a counter message for other constituencies, constituent elements that I'm gonna to torture, I'm gonna to raise a military budget, it's gonna be the biggest military the world's ever seen, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and also, and uh, if you read a book uh, by Michael Ledeen and Flynn, published in 2016, which I just had occasion to go back and look at, it laid out the Trump foreign policy, you could say. Michael Ledeen is a genuine, in my opinion, and self-admitted fascist with all of his lifetime's work. And Flynn joined him in that, I would argue, as did the Trump administration. But, uh, and I use a term as Mussolini defined it as a uh, objective political term, not, not as a, just a mere defamation, but Mussolini defined the term fascist to being militaristic, expansionistic, authoritarian, and uh, uh, which pretty much covers what the United States has become. But uh, uh, so, uh, so with Trump, of course, there is no hope of anybody getting released. I think there was one guy released, but only because he is a Saudi citizen and Trump was forging those ties ever closer between Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the United States. Uh, you know, plus a couple of other Arab states. Uh, but it was only for the purpose of uh, going to war against Iran. You know, uh, same with the occasional person that says uh, something against, you know, Republican going to war against uh, Russia, for example. Well, then if you do a closer look, you know, it's because they want to go to war against China first. You know, it's not because they're against U.S. wars. It's, uh, well, let's go attack China first. I'm thinking of pe people like Josh Hawley and, and uh, one or two others. Uh, and so, uh, so unfortunately, the two sides sort of came together. I'll call it liberals or progressives, you know, never Trump Republicans, too, who said Trump is, you know, what's he doing? He's ruining the, you know, the NATO and all these things, you know, uh, he's disarming America, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and it, worked, it, it worked for the other message he wanted to send to the, you know, anti-war, few anti-war Republicans to say, see, he's ending the endless wars. When in fact, he was, he and John McCain, of course, Lindsey Graham's always there, boosting military spending beyond anything ever seen before. This began immediately in 2017, pro, you know, following through with his pro campaign promise to uh, make the U.S. military more powerful than anything ever seen in the world before. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I, I re I'd read occasionally, oh, Trump's moving, pulling troops out of the Mideast. Well, then take a closer look and, and you read military you know, publications and he's moving them up to China or he's moving them to Camp Trump in Poland, you know, or into Estonia. Uh, and so what he did was he basically created the military force that Biden is now using to threaten Russia. Uh, and again, none of this is to defend or, or act as apologist for Russia, Putin, or anybody else, but it's to point out that we've gone through four administrations now. Each one has consistently uh, taken the military to ever higher levels. Uh, you know, uh, when the Republicans demanded $25 billion more to the military budget in the past year, you know, there's no shortage of Democrats who joined them, you know, in that call. Uh, there's no need for $25 billion more. Now, <laughs> The, you know, the, the journals, the so-called intellectual journals, uh, foreign policy, foreign affairs, they're calling for even more military spending. I just came out yesterday. It's just beyond belief what they're calling for. And foreign affairs, they say, we got to go back and study uh, Albert Wollstead, who had been the, you know, the, the big bomb guy of the Cold War. It's, it's insane what we become. And uh, I don't know where I do diverge from your question, but what is the answer? Uh, this group of anti-torture people, not not the Twin Cities one, but a um, you know a more you know, higher level one, I'll say higher level, in uh, former officials of the uh, Obama administration, you know once in a while they'll still say we got to have accountability. Well, that's just a pipe dream. There'll be no accountability of these officials when we're going off to war again. You know, it's just not the way it works. And so, I mean, just show how perverse this is. John Brennan is now associated with Fordham University's law school. Uh, Fordham was one time a vigorous opponent of torture, and now they're allied with John Brennan and features him as a senior fellow in programs, just like this past week, uh, you know, as if he's never committed a war crime, never was responsible for the torture, the invasion of the Senate, you know, to spy on it during the, the investigation of torture. It's, it's just beyond belief to me, uh, so. Anyway, I don't know if I answered that question, but. Uh... 
Yeah, put maybe, me back on track if I'm to get to the question itself if I wander too much. Yeah, maybe just loop back to the so so because of our our march to war that uh, there's really going to be no recourse for these uh, uh, approved detainees that are are approved for release, but probably so, won't be. So with the case of Biden, it's it's conceivable he will let at least some of them go. Uh, I mean, Ob Obama did let a lot of people go. Yeah. Uh, Biden is not an Obama, in my opinion, for both good and bad. But uh, but Obama did let Chelsea Manning go, for example, you know, and uh, but I don't see Biden doing the same or Julian Assange, who should also be released. Uh, and again, we're we're heightening the wars now, and so the you know again you look at how this all works, all the constituencies out there for harsher measures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I I could. Hope I'll hope for some detainees, prisoners, to be released under Biden. They would not have been under Trump at all, uh, except as a you know payoff to Saudi. Uh, so maybe under Biden there will be some, but again, it doesn't ease the long term, the real problem we have of what we become. It, you know, it seems from our, our experience anyway is that uh, when when asked about uh, reform it, things that. Biden has promised in the past from his campaign promises. Uh, they say that it's it's a priority, but it's it's not a priority. That we, we'll get to this, but we just don't have time to work on it right now. And uh, that seems to be a good way to pass the buck and let these things roll on. And does anybody else have any any questions? Let me just add really quick here. So I'm not trying to be defeatist uh, in all this. But I think it's important, and this I argue all the time, we need to begin understanding the true nature of what the United States is. You know, if we do release some, doesn't mean that 20 more won't be added and then start another cycle of lifetime imprisonment. One final point or one other point is uh, indefinite detention. The Physicians for Human Rights came out with a report way back in 2011 or so, pointing out that indefinite detention at some point becomes torture. So all these people we've been keeping in indefinite attention all these years, even if actual, con you know, even if conditions improved a bit at Guantanamo, didn't change the fact that they are still being tortured. They're being tortured with indefinite detention. Any other questions? We're a little over our time, but it's been very informative. Todd, I want to thank you for your time today and your insight. Like I said, it's been an excellent presentation. And um, maybe we'll have you back again this year, since this is the 20th anniversary of Guantanamo. And uh, we are committed as a group to do everything we can this year to raise awareness and to um, try and pressure people to close Guantanamo and release the detainees that have been re, uh, cleared for release already. One, Go ahead. Um, one thing that would be helpful is if there could be even some pre-information before hearing your talk that I can, I and others can just kind of, so we understand all the language and we understand, I mean, I understood quite a bit of it from being at, in T3, but you know, it'd be good to know all that. And I just do have, I just didn't get my mute button. But one question I have too is like you say that you realize that there was all lies. I remember when I started realizing how we contribute to, you know, hunger issues in Guatemala. And it was a moment like, oh my gosh, I could never really understand power relations in the, in, the, in um, you know, in current events and in the newspapers. And I asked this question too to, um, Larry Wilkerson, in his moment was when he knew that Colin Powell was lying. That was that just that just in an instant changed everything. So, do you have a moment that really changed things for you when all of a sudden, wow? Uh, not an instantaneous, a, a moment of an instant, but my experience in the first Gulf War and seeing the lies there opened my mind to the fact that we do lie. Uh, and, and seeing the destruction, you know, I mean, I wasn't on the front lines there. I was uh, in the rear echelon, so to speak. But uh, I took a trip up, you know, right after the war, drove through the valley of death, 
so-called Valley of Death, or you know, Valley of Death, and uh, saw all that destruction and whatnot, and it just began uh, opening my mind to uh, it. It'd been sort of an abstract idea before that well, we shouldn't be on these wars, but we, remember we hadn't been in wars for quite a while. Then, then here it came, and uh, and seeing it again, I'd I'd been an opponent of the Vietnam War in in the soft way that most people became. Uh, but I wasn't anti-military, you know, my dad had been the Bataan Death March and whatnot. So, so, uh, uh, so I became more anti-military over time as I learned more about it. And uh, the first Gulf War is what really began opening my eyes to that. But uh, if anybody would be interested, I could be sending a few things to you occasionally as I come across them. And if you do invite me back, I can have more information ahead of time for you. Uh, we're always interested to hear what you have to say, so feel free. Feel free. I'll, I'll send you the link to our Google group that you can share emails with, and that goes out to our whole group. And uh, also, um, I'm, I'd like to get a blog uh, capability on our website that you could, you could post some blog posts there as well. So we'll work on that in the coming year. That, that'd be great. I, I am uh, very slowly, if there's anybody who, uh... I've got a website built already, Project for the Study of American Militarism, but it hasn't gone live yet. And quite honestly, I'm slow in getting it live just because then I need to start doing more work on it. Uh, but if anybody's interested in that, uh, uh, you know, can maybe collaborate or something. And uh, be before saying goodbye, let me just say once again, thanks for having me here. Apologize again for last time, but thanks for having me here. And let me say again how much, or let me say how much I respect what all of you guys are doing because, you know, you ask me what can be done. Well, you're doing what can be done. You know, without this citizen involvement, there's no hope. So you're helping me keep some hope. So thank you very much for that. Thanks for that, Todd. We really appreciate it. All right, um, let's close the meeting with that. Thank you.